Hi, I'm Quaid, uh, Quaid Morris. I'm a member of the Morris Lab. In fact, that's my lab. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's easy to forget that in lab meeting. Uh, and um, um, I'm a computational biologist from the University of Toronto. Uh, I've been working in this field. I've had my lab for uh, going on 12 years now. Um, and uh, as Anne said, I'll be talking about gene function prediction today. Uh, you've heard a lot about networks and interaction networks and modules, and we're going to try to put some of those ideas together to, to use these things to say something about gene function. So uh, this is another way, uh, in addition to the, um, uh, the sorts of things that, uh, that Robin told you about, to, to try to use uh, these interaction network data in your research um, uh, using, uh, uh, with your gene lists. Um, so, what are our learning objectives? Okay, this is the one. Okay, good. All right. So, um, start down here. So, um, basically, we're going to uh, uh, move towards answering two types of questions about gene function. One is, what does my gene do? Like, what is its function? And the other question we're going to try to answer is, give me more genes like these. Right, so if I have a list of genes, say those that are involved in wind signaling, can you find more genes like uh, these wind signaling genes? And the data that we're going to use to try to find this information out are, are going to be these interaction networks. And the, way, uh, the reason I'm posing the questions like this is, is I think this is an easy way to interact with these interaction networks, which can be kind of complicated, it can be incomplete, and, and their meaning is not always entirely clear. And I'll... I'll um, say more about that, those ideas in, in, uh, as I give the talk. Right? And so answering these questions uh, involves understanding some key concepts. Uh, functional interaction network, which uh, I'm sure Robin went over, but it would be helpful for me to explain again. Um, guilt by association, so that's the concept or that's the, that's the technique we're going to use to try to infer some things about gene function. And basically the idea is if you interact with genes of this given function, that's evidence that you yourself have that function. And then the last concept is the gene recommender system. And so those are the interfaces that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to focus on one particular interface called Gene Mania uh, that was developed in my lab and Gary Bader's lab. Uh, but there are a number of other interfaces that, that make use of the same concepts, give access to the same data, and have some of the similar functionality. And we're going to talk about one of those other interfaces called the string uh, interface. Okay. So um, when, I, when applying guilt by association, there's going to be sort of two ways in which guilt by association can be inferred. So one way is, is by direct interaction. Do you directly interact with genes that have this function? And the other way is, is something that I call label propagation, but it's, it came up in Robin's lecture in, in the form of modules. So the idea is, can you identify like groups of genes that are all interacting with one another? And if you remember one of these groups of genes or these modules, you're more likely to share a function with those the genes that are already in that module. Right? And so label propagation is, is one of the ways in which you can identify modules, is one way to think about it. And so, and then finally, um, when we're answering the question, give me more genes like these we're going to want to use the network data in a different way than when we ask the question, what does my gene do? And so when we, have, when we ask the question, give me more genes like these, you're asking a question about a specific type of function. And some networks might be better at inferring that function than other networks. So you will want to reweight the networks when you look for evidence of interaction. Okay, I just wanted to give you a general overview. If uh, the concepts that I've talked about so far aren't that clear, they're going to become clear through, the, uh, through my lecture because these are our learning objectives. Okay, and by going through the learning objectives, I've pretty much given you the outline. So we're going to talk first about what a functional interaction network is, or remind you what it is, go over these concepts that I, I introduced, and talk about algorithms for scoring these, uh, these um, uh, guilt by association. I'm going to introduce Gene Mania to you, then I'm going to give you a quick uh, demo, on, uh, demo on the website. Uh, it's a pretty easy website to use. But I'll go through and press all the buttons for you so you know what they, what they do. And I would encourage you to fool around with the uh, website yourself. It's been des is designed to be 
uh, user friendly. Uh, then I'll go into these what I'm calling these different network weighting schemes where you can evaluate networks based on what type of evidence they're going to help to uh, they're going to present about gene function. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, string, which is a, uh, another gene recommender system. Okay, so what I'm trying to illustrate in this slide is that if you want to, to make use of all these different uh, sources of data in your own research, um, it becomes a bit complicated. I mean, these databases, they're large, they're, they're incomplete, their relationship to each other isn't necessarily that clear. Right? And so this is why we define these concepts. One of the first concepts uh, illustrated in this slide is uh, the, the idea of a functional interaction network. So what's shown on this slide on the left is a, is a figure of microarray expression data from what is now a classic paper in the field uh, from uh, Mike Eisen et al., uh, Pat Brown's lab in uh, 1998, where what they did was they uh, made a microarray and they profiled gene expression under a variety of different conditions. And this is probably a figure that is familiar to most of you by now, but what this is is this matrix or this array of numbers here shows using a false color heat map, so green meaning up and red meaning down or vice versa, I can never remember which is which, it doesn't really matter for this case. Um, so the rows correspond to genes, and the columns correspond to different conditions or different cellular stresses, and what's shown here is the, uh, intera uh, the expression profile of a given gene across those conditions. And the genes have been sorted uh, using hierarchical clustering, so the genes with similar expression profiles were beside each other. And the observation that they made, and so these two are blow-ups of different regions in this, uh, in this plot, uh, the observation that they made was, if you look at the uh, assigned function for these genes, you see that the assigned function correlates with the uh, gene expression profile, meaning that gene, uh, genes with similar expression profiles had similar functions. Right. And so the, the value of that observation, uh, which is, you, is illustrated here in this, uh, the network figure beside it, is that if you then arrange the genes according to in a network where the nodes represent genes and this, the strength of, or of the links or the thickness of the edges here correspond to how highly correlated those genes are and then you annotate the genes in the network that have known function and you have two genes in the network that have unknown function well the genes that are interacting with ones with uh, known function or have high interactions and say they're unknown you, you can have a pretty good idea or initial guess about what the function of those genes actually is. Okay. And so this network here, which is describing the gene expression profile, so the weight of the edges represent the, the degree of correlation, in general, this is called functional interaction network, meaning that there's some correlation between the strength of the link between genes and the likelihood they share at least some aspect of their function. Right. Now, function is a big word, right? Function can mean a lot of things, right? And so, there, you know, what is the what is the aspect of the function that's being represented here? Well, it's it's some aspect of their function. Genes that are uh, co-expressed probably in this case, which was I, I think a variety of cellular stresses and deletion mutants, they, they probably represent a shared stress response in the cell. But in general, we don't necessarily know what type of function a network is representing but we know that the link gives us some hint of functional interaction. So what we're going to, uh, what we're going to want to do, and here in the next slide talks about the different types of functional interaction networks. So, so there's directly measured interactions. You've seen some of those today. So you can directly measure whether or not two pairs of protein interact or whether or not there's a complex of proteins that all co-purify together, and that's called a protein interaction network. You can measure uh, synthetic uh, pairwise genetic interaction networks. Um, you can infer interactions from a da uh, single data source, and we saw that with the co-expression network. There's other, way, there's other gene expression profiling studies uh, from which you can infer this, these types of things. You could also infer the functional interaction by sequence similarity. Right? Genes with similar protein sequence probably have similar biochemical function. Um, and then there's a bit of a, like an industry, um, especially in the early aughts, uh, which was uh, inferring interaction by combining together data from multiple um, data sources. And that's partially what we're doing here at Gmania. And so 
but what people have published, including the network um, that Robin told you about in the last module, are networks that combine together data from a variety of different sources to get kind of a composite measure of functional interaction. Right? Okay. So here what we're going to be trying to do is we're going to be trying to use these interaction networks as the data sources that we're going to query to answer the specific questions that I talked about. So one is, what does my gene do? So the idea is, is you, we have a gene, it's shown up in a screen, you have, don't really know that much about it, maybe there's not much in the literature, but you want to get some idea of what that gene might, what function, function role it might be playing. Right? And so there, the goal is to determine a gene function or say something about it based on who it interacts with. And this is like the guilt by association case that I talked about. Right? Um, you know what a gene does by what the genes it interacts with do. Uh, and, but there's another type of question, which is give me more genes like these. Right? Say you're trying to set up some sort of medium scale screen. Maybe you're interested in, for example, the wind signaling pathway as one of my early collaborators was. You want to find more kinases, you want to find more members of protein complex, you want to for, find more members uh, of disease genes, right? So that's a different type of question, and that's a question we can also try to use, uh, answer using uh, functional interaction data. So we want to answer the question, what does my gene do? So we take the input, which is all the network and profile data we can get our hands on. Uh, we take a query list, which in this case is just a single gene, and we, and we push those two through a gene recommender system. And so what's a gene recommender system? It's a, a system that recommends genes. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> in case it wasn't clear, obviously. So like, it's like Amazon. You, know, you like this book? Well, you're going to like these books too. It's the same sort of idea. If you were interested in this gene, these are the other genes that interact with it. These, these are probably the ones you want to look at. What's a false positive? It's, it's something that you say is true, but it's not true. <laughs> you know, that's a very hard question to answer because it, this is just a single gene, yeah. right? So if it's just a single gene, you don't know what question is being asked, right? There's no bad answer. There's no bad answer. <laughs> So, so, I mean, in Gmania, well, I'll show you later, you can adjust the question that's being asked by saying what data sources you're willing to query for answers. Um, but if you don't put anything in, then we just, we just find uh, genes that are likely to have the same biological function, meaning as, as defined by uh, the gene ontology biological process hierarchy, which you've heard about probably two days ago. Is that right? Yeah? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, right, and so so here, you know, the best thing you could do is like run this through the gene recommender system, or at least uh, using Gmania, then do some sort of enrichment analysis. And you've, you've heard about that yesterday, I think. Right, so here's the gene. These are its like 20 closest associates. Are there any uh, pathways or uh, categories of gene function that are enriched among its associates? If there are, then that might say something about the function of this gene. Okay, that gives you additional information. Also, what you can sort of see here is you can see there's connections of different types and different colors between that gene and its associates, and those are telling you how those genes are linked together. What the data is that says that these are interacting. So some of it's physical interaction data, some of it is predicted interactions because those, uh, those two genes, inter uh, orthologs, those genes interact in a different organism. Sometimes it's co-expression. Okay. So the black ones are the ones that are in curves? So the, 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 the black one with the, so the one with the diagonal lines is your query. Mm -hmm. And all the other ones are the ones that are inferred. And they're colored based on whether or not they've been assigned one of these three functions. What is the black one? Black means it has it's not been assigned any of those functions. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's not black with like black with the uh, with the diagonals means that it's uh, it's part of your query list. Mm -hmm. Okay. And any other questions about this? Okay. Okay. And so when you're answering these types of questions, you can you can use anything you have basically. And and again, this issue that Francis brought up: if you put too much data in. 
Maybe you'll get a mis mishmash of different things. But you know, generally speaking, you get uh, a pretty good initial guess at what's going on. At least you can see the other genes that, uh, that interact well. And then you can iterate. You can take those genes and put them back in and ask a different type of question to try to refine the question that you're asking about the gene function. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. OK. So now, you know, back to this question, what are you asking about when you ask uh, about function? Like, what does you know, P53 do? Well, depending on who you ask, you get a lot of different answers to this question, right? right P53, it's a transcription factor, right? Um, everybody knows that it's the most famous uh, tumor suppressor, right? Um, it, it plays a role in apoptosis, it pay, plays a role in responding to DNA damage. It's got a lot of different functions. It's probably the gene with the most functions assigned to it, right? So, so if you want to say, what does P53 do? Well, you could say, well, this is the, func the, the aspect of function that I'm interested in. And it's important to say what aspect of function you're interested in because some of the networks might be better for some types of gene function than others. Right? Okay, so for example, one of the networks that people generate is this uh, network of protein sequence similarity. Often what that tells you most about is whether or not they have the same biochemical function, whether they have the same enzymatic activity. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, an organism is going to behave the same way or have the same phenotype if those two genes that have high sequence similarity are knocked out, right? Because they could be expressed under different conditions, for example. Okay. So one way of, of okay, and so in order to answer these types of questions, you need what I'm calling a context-dependent set of networks. And so that means a, a set of networks that is designed to answer the question about function that you're interested in, not an arbitrary set. And so how do you define the question you're asking? Well, one of the ways to define the question you're asking is define the query by providing context. Right? So Memphis is a city in Tennessee. And Memphis is also a, a city in ancient uh, Egypt. Right? And so depending upon what question you're asking, if you just put Memphis in, you might get information about both, both versions of Memphis. Right? But if you, mention, if you see, it, say, a couple more cities in Tennessee, well, I can tell you more cities like Memphis in that way. You, if you, meant you put in a couple more cities in ancient and modern right. Egypt, you can get more cities that way. Okay? Right, so you provide context. And that's this idea like give me more genes like these. By providing that gene list, you say, well, this is the aspect of gene function that I'm interested in. OK, and so this is how this works. So you have network and profile data. You have a query list plug it into your gene recommender system. And so now I've, I've like colored things a little bit more. So as before, we have the genes in the query list are in this network, which is really hard to see. I'm sorry about that, but you'll see it online in a second. And the black ones are ones that are also, uh, that aren't in the query list, but are the sort of the, the guilty associates, right? And then the functions, have I've just annotated those as a way of like helping to um, navigate through this, this network that you have here. And the individual networks are indicated by colored links, which maybe that came through in, in the hard copy. It's not coming through on this projector, but it will come through on the interface itself. Okay. And so now all the other genes that have uh, come along uh, with this query list are probably more genes like the ones you're interested in. And you can use, uh, again, enrichment as a way of saying something about the shared function in the list. OK. So I guess this is the point at which I show one of the demos. Great. OK. So this is just our website. If you type in Gene Mania, we still have the trademark. So nobody else has called Gene Mania yet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm just going to push EG to get an example gene list. Uh, in general, you can just type those in there, and I'm going to press search. And it's going to take about a minute for it to load. Um, no, it's actually pretty good. Okay, great. So, oh, that's interesting. Someone has adjusted the, uh, the default options. Just a second here. Okay. 
I want 20 gene. I want 20 other genes. Okay, so what happened there is it just gave me back my query list and it showed me how they are, were interacting with one another uh, in the sort of the network interface that was in the middle, but I didn't get any other, other genes. So I was unhappy with that. Okay, and now you're happy. Now I'm happy. <laughs> now I've gotten what I've expected. <laughs> okay, uh, as, as I indicated before, these are the genes in the query list, the ones with the lines. These are the genes that came along for the ride. Um, I think the query list was drawn from like um, genes in human involved in DNA damage response. Because um, I see BRCA uh, in this list. I don't know. It's a query list that makes a nice looking network, uh, is how we chose it initially. Okay, so let me just take you through the things that are on the side. And then I'm going to press all the buttons, and then I'm going to go back to um, uh, I'm going to go back to my uh, presentation. So here um, is the network. So you can make this panel go away if you think it looks too messy, but I like it. And so there's the networks that are being shown here. They're organized into six different categories. The predicted networks. These are predicted interactions. They weren't directly measured or observed in human. They're predicted because um, the genes that are connected by these links interact in other organisms. Their orthologs interact in other organisms. Okay. And so you can you know, hover over there, you see it, click it on and off, it, the lines appear and disappear. This little arrow also expands it out. This is a category of networks. And so these are all the various networks that are contributing to that category, and you can see individual networks by just hovering over here. Okay. And it's the same thing with the physical interactions. So these are all the individual networks, and I'm happy I'll uh, explain in a second what all these weird names mean. Um, here are the shared protein domains. So this is, this is a way of measuring sequence similarity, but we filter it first by looking at whether or not they have the, uh, the same like PFAM or interprotein domains. Did, did anyone present PFAM and Interpro to you? No? Okay. Okay. So, um, who knows that proteins are made up of domains? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And, and so, um, uh, Ensemble is, uh, there are various bioinformatics organizations, but they, they've uh, condensed around the idea that you can describe those domains using what's called a profile HMM. It's something that you can now scan a new protein sequence and score it according to how likely you think it is that it has that domain. So for any time that you submit a genome to Ensemble, there's a whole analysis pipeline goes through. One of the things that happens is they score all the protein sequences based on these domains and then assign those domains to them. Okay. Right. And so when we started, there are like two different sources for those domains. There's probably about like eight different sources for what are called domain models, which are these scoring systems. And the major ones are PFAM and Interpro. Okay. And so in, for, for these shared protein domain networks, this tells you whether or not the, the connected genes uh, seem to share predicted domains. Any questions about that? Exactly. It's sequence similarity, but at the domain level. Yeah. One of these days we should actually put sequence similarity in, but we don't have it yet. Okay. And then these are just co-expression networks. And the way in which we do co-expression networks is every few years we go to Gene Expression Omnibus and we download all the expression data that we recognize as being on, a, on an AFI array or an Agilent array, and we, we automatically make a new co-expression network. So um, we have some minimum size, and I think that minimum size is like 20 uh, experiments that have to be in that uh, database, but we constantly update the co-expression. Uh, pathway, so genes are connected together here if they've been assigned the same pathway. And this is one of the pathway databases. We have multiple pathway databases. And co-localization is kind of a weird category. In yeast, it means that the, uh, that the protein products of the gene co-localize in the same part of the cell. In, in human and, and mouse, it means that the genes are expressed in the similar set of tissues. 
Okay, so that's the network tab. I can also hover over genes and that tells me all the genes it interacts with. I can click on a gene, get some information about that gene, including a link out that will take me to the uh, gene description page. So you can get a description of the gene from, um, from PubMed. The other thing that you can do is if you find a gene that you think should have been in your list, you can click on it and say add and it'll restart the, uh, the process expanding your query list. So as I was saying before, if you start with a single gene, you want to know about, more about its function and you find its 20 closest associates, then you can click, click those other ones that you are the aspects that have the function or aspects that you're interested in to change the query list. Okay, so let me just press all the other buttons for you so you've seen them all pressed. I'm going to stay away from this button because I'm going to explain to it as explained earlier. You can change the organism. There's uh, eight different organisms, is that right? Nine. Nine different organisms that we support. What does this button do? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's the search button. <laughs> Every organism has a, its own query list. Okay, so these three buttons, they just, uh, they re-lay out the graph. So this is one of my uh, favorite ones. So this, this layout, what it does is, these genes here on this side, they're all the query list. And, oh, what happened here? And then these ones, these are all the, the guilty associates. So these are the, um, these are the other genes that were returned, and they're sorted by how guilty they are. So this is the one that has the strongest association with the query list, and this is the one with the uh, smallest association among those in this list. Right, so we're, on this case, only showing the top 20, and you can change that if you want. Okay. Um, and if you don't like lines, you like circles instead, you can use this layout. It does the same thing as this one, but with, uh, with the circles. And then this is this layout is called, um, um, I can't remember the name. Uh, what? No, it's not <laughs> random. No. It's, it's a force directed layout. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, it's a force directed layout. So what this, uh, which this, what, what this means is, is genes um, the, the are closest together, the nodes for the genes are closest together the ones that they most highly interact with. And, and because um, when, you, when you do this layout algorithm, there's a little bit of randomness. It, 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 it can end up in a different place if you start it from a different place. You can sort of redo the force-directed layout to get a similar layout, but one that's slightly different by just pressing it. It's not random. It's Does it bring together it's probably query versus non-query? No, it, it ignores query versus non-query genes. Yeah. Okay. And what do these buttons do? What does this one do? Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, and here's the information. And this is if you want to um, uh, save any of this information. So you can get like a, you can get an online report. You can download these images, right? And you can also get like a, uh, a text file with the data about all the networks that are shown uh, on this list. So play around with those. I mean, which are the, which are the available formats for the images? Is it only JPEG or is there another Uh It should be SVG. Oh, huh. Well, I guess it's only JPEG. Wow. Okay. Uh, it used to be, uh, we used to give SVG, but I didn't like that because I. Didn't have anything that displayed SVG easily, so now it's JPEG. Um, but I think if you go to the report, no, the report's not SVG either. Okay, sorry, JPEG it is. Okay, and then this is remember the nodes were colored. Well, this is how you color the nodes. So what's happening here is we take this list and we do a gene set enrichment analysis. We do like the the um, um, the Fisher's exact test version of it. And then you can color nodes um, according to the functions that they have. So just by clicking on them, the, uh, the gene sets are, are sorted by their false discovery rate. And the coverage just says how many, what proportion of the genes in the, in the set genome-wide. There's 151 genes genome-wide that have the 
Go annotation DNA recombination. Of them, 23 of them are shown here. That's what that means. Okay, any questions about that? And I'll go back and finish off the concepts that I wanted you to understand. Great. Okay. And we didn't go through that other button, uh, but I'll go through the other button later. Okay. So, um, one of the things you saw is you saw network weights. Um, what do those network weights mean? And how do we get them? Okay. So, uh, I'm distinguishing between two different types of ways of weighting networks. One way is uh, what I call context independent. So regardless of your gene list, all the networks get the same weight. The, 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 sorry, let me say it again, because what I said initially was wrong. Okay. The, the weight that a network gets assigned doesn't depend on your gene list. But some networks can get weighted more if they are in general, have just better data in them, or are more informative about gene function. Okay. So that's what I call context independent network weighting. And so you can pre-combine the networks by simple addition or predetermining the weight. So, like I said in the first slide where I introduced the idea of a functional interaction network, I said, okay, here's the functional interaction network that, express, uh, that, uh, that represents co-expression. So if we find like just a common scale for all these, uh, all these links, so like they're weighted, say, zero to one, zero meaning there's no interaction at all, and one meaning we're almost certain that all the function that these two genes have is shared, we can make a composite network, which looks a little bit ugly here, but you can imagine the weight between two genes is just equal to the sum of the weights between those two genes in each one of the networks. Right? That's the easiest way to combine these together. Right? So if you see an interaction between a gene pair, in multiple just different ways of measuring functional interaction between genes, that gives you a good idea that there's, a, there's strong evidence that these two genes share function. Okay. Now, uh, you can take that idea and, and expand on it a little bit by like changing the weight depending upon um, how reliable or informative you think a data source is. Right? So most gene expression networks not very informative. So on average, it'll get kind of smaller weight. Uh, genetic and uh, physical interaction networks tend to be much more informative because they tell you about complexes. And function usually is shared among genes and complexes. So they'll get a little bit more weight. And uh, various people, including uh, G-Mania, have uh, pre-computed weights for all these networks based on how good they are at recovering what's known about gene function. Okay, so that's a, those are context-independent networks. But again, you have this problem that who knows what question you're asking when you put T53, uh, P53 in. Okay. So the other, op the other option is a context-dependent uh, weighting. So the idea here, once again, you assign a weight to each network. And so you take the weight of the interaction in the network, you multiply it by the weight assigned to the network, and then you sum up for a given pair of genes this, these, these weights. So you take a weighted average of the links between them as a way of inferring evidence for shared function. And where do these weights come from? Well, these weights come from looking at the gene list itself. If you give me a long list of genes, you can ask the question, well, in what networks are these genes well connected to one another and not well connected to other genes? Does that make sense? If you find a network where the genes in your list are all linked together, that network probably provides pretty good information about other genes that might be associated with them. Does that make sense? Now, you don't want the network to link all the genes together because that's not specific information, but if the network largely links the genes in your list together and doesn't link them to too many other genes, that's, that's good evidence that that network is telling you, capturing the aspect of gene function that's represented by that list. And that's, you know, that's essentially how we're assigning weights in a context-dependent manner. I mean, the way we actually do it is using linear regression, but I mean, the, the actual technique you use doesn't matter so much as the uh, intuition for um, how that works. And so, basically, there are two rules 
uh, that get satisfied by the means uh, that we use to weight the networks and other people use similar ideas. One is relevance, right? So the network should be relevant to predicting the function of interest. And that's, this is the test I just told you about. Are the genes in the query list more often connected to one another than to other genes? Right? So there's another important rule um, that we discovered when we started including a lot of co-expression data is it's really easy to get co-expression data. So we have hundreds of co-expression networks in our interface and only a small, a relatively small number of like physical interaction sets. So in that case, you want to make sure that your network doesn't, it, the information it provides is not redundant with other data sets, right? So this is particularly a problem of co-expression. So the test here is like, do two networks share many of their interactions, right? So, so if you see a co-expression network and it looks a lot similar to another co-expression network, well, um, maybe it, those two are providing redundant information, right? And so, you know, ultimately, if you're weighting the networks correctly, if I took the same network and I, I assigned it a weight, let's say I gave it a weight of five, and then I just took that network and then repeated it 10 times and then reassigned the weights, then the total weight those 10 re, uh, repeats should get should be equal to five, right? Because it's not telling you anything new, adding these additional networks, aren't is Okay, so those are the concepts behind the network weighting schemes. And in the Gene Mania interface, uh, we give you access to choosing what weighting scheme you're going to use. So we have a default because I like it when you know you just put the list into a system and press a button and it has like good behavior. And so I think that's a nice way to design things. So by default, we design we choose between two uh, two weighting schemes. If you don't give us enough genes, or if you only give us one gene, well, we have a default way that we weight things. And basically, we weight the networks based on how well the group of networks that you've selected re uh, recovers um, um, shared gene ontology biological process function. Right. So two genes should, be, should have higher um, uh, weight in our interaction network if they share a lot of their biological process functions. And so we compute that, and we can compute that on the fly if you change the selection of, of networks. Uh, but if you use our default selection of networks, it's already cached and it's a bit faster. And so if you have one gene or you have less than, I think, five genes, that's what we do. You can change the default behavior, but uh, uh, that's the default behavior. But if you have a longer list, like six genes or more, then we actually try to do this, this context-dependent weighting. So we actually try to infer which networks are most relevant to your query. So you put a long gene list, you get the list of networks that are relevant to your query, and you'll get their weights. And from my point of view, that's actually, that information alone is very informative. So if you have a list you don't know anything about, what's happening when we weight networks is we're telling you what, is, what are the networks that best connect that list together. Right, so you take a list, you don't know what that list is from, we can be like, wow, look, these are like highly co-expressed, and they're highly co-expressed in this particular study that has this high weight. And you can go and look at that study and see what it was that they were actually measuring the co-expression for. So the weights themselves, when you have a long gene list, can, can be informative. Okay. All right, um, so just to take you through what uh, these not very carefully selected terms mean, so um, query dependent weighting, this is the default automatically selected weighting method. And I told you there's, there's two different um, um, defaults. Um, now, if you're not happy with this, you can choose assign based on query genes. So that forces the interface to do this, this uh, gene list dependent weighting. We don't suggest that for shorter lists because of what's called overfitting. Basically, there's not enough information in the short gene list to give you reliable network weights. So sometimes network weights are due to some degree of randomness or some degree of luck. Right? Um, but if your list has like 10 or more genes, these are, the, the network weights become much more reliable. So you can force it based on that. Or if you just use the default, it's going to default to assign based on query genes. Uh, for six more genes. If you want to be a bit more conservative, you can use geontology based weighting. So uh, the biological process based, that's what I told you the default was when the gene list is small. 
So we we try to weight uh, we weight networks based on how well they they recover co shared function shared biological function. But if you want to change your mind and say something about shared molecular function, so they have similar biochemical activities, or uh, uh, shared localization, are they in the same cellular compartment expressing the same set of tissues? So that's the other way that you can weight networks. These, all these three, they ignore the query list. They don't care about the query list. They're only looking at patterns of, of, of shared annotation for the genes across the genome. Um, and the last type of weighting is called equal weighting. So um, here, equal weighting, there's two types of ways you can equally weight networks. You can say, look, I don't know anything, uh, but I want all the data types to have equal weights. So like physical interactions should be weighted the same way that co-expression is, that genetic interactions are. Um, so that will force each of the categories to have equal weight so that they're contributing the same amount to, uh, to your final measure of interaction. Um, but the, you can also equally weight by network. So some of those categories have more networks than others. So that co-expression has like probably 300 networks. Physical interactions probably has like 80 networks. So if you weight, weight equally by network, you get you know, 300 over eight, uh, 80 times more weighting on, on, uh, on a given physical interaction network. But so you, 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 the, the amount that a, uh, a category contributes uh, scales with a, a number of networks that are in it. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. So, so the question is, with a small gene list, could you get over, uh, uh, around the problem with overfitting by like uh, simulation? So we haven't tried that. Because I mean, we are trying to, when we designed the website in the first place, and we've tried to maintain it this way, is we want something that's responsive, that takes like you know, in general, less than a minute to respond to you. Um, and a lot of this sort of uh, so the algorithms we we selected were ones that we felt were pretty good, but were also fast enough that they could be done on the fly. And so. And simulation would take much longer time in, in that case. So for example, um, maybe I should show you the extra button now. So you, you can get a sense of why we made the types of decisions that we did. So, so here's where you can choose the networks. Uh, now it's uh, back to networks. OK, so here's, the, here's all the networks that we have. I guess there's a lot more physical interaction data sets now than I remember. So, here, this is just the way to go through and select the various types of networks. So let's go through and select the co-expression networks. And so by default, we thought the co-expression wasn't very informative. So by default, we just include the 20 most informative networks. But we can turn them all on. Uh, I can't remember how to do that. I think it's like this. Yeah. So that turns them all on. Click again, turns them all off, on. Or we can just take the first three because they're from labs that we trust. Open up here, you get a little bit more information. This is the study and a link out to where the co-expression data was drawn from, and this is a link out to the entry in the gene ontology, uh, the gene expression omnibus um, uh, database. And then these are labels that we've automatically assigned uh, to this data set based on analyzing the PubMed uh, entry. Right, and so. So here you can choose an arbitrary, arbitrary collection of networks every time you do the query. So what that means is, is that all the network weighting that we have to do has to be done on the fly, even ones that, that look at co-annotation co patterns. Um, so we, we, we chose, that's, that's where our, the, our constraints in choosing the algorithms came from. The other thing that you can do is you can upload your own data. So if you have a network in basically a three or two column format where you have a genes, genes, and then weight if you want, or just weight them all equally if you don't want, and you just upload that network and include it in all your queries in the same way that you include other data. Right. If you do that, you want to use one of these weighting schemes probably where you force its weight to be non-zero uh, non because if your network's not very informative for your query list, it's going to get a weight of zero. 
So I've changed the networks that I'm looking at. In fact, let's, let's just look at uh, just protein interaction networks. So I'm only interested in, in how the genes in this list are physically interacting with one another. And I would like to, um, I don't want that many genes back. And I'm going to assign them all equal weight. Right, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Francis's question is, can we is select for protein interaction data that comes from more than one study? Um, sort of. Let's say that. Um, right, so, so in one way, we're already implicitly doing that. Um, because, like as you can see here, there's a bunch of different, each one of these, if we click on the edge between them, there's, you know, each one of these links is, uh, we're telling you what the support is. So, so uh, some of these links have a lot of protein support. Now, I should say one caveat is that uh, some of these networks are overlapping and redundant with one another. Okay, uh, I might as well say that. Uh, I don't have too much more material left, so let me go into a little bit more detail. Um, where you see this, this indicates a specific study. Right. So, but the other thing is, is there are at least eight or nine groups that, that go through and they curate protein interaction data uh, studies, and they put together their own networks. And so we, we download those too. Um, and those are indicated by uh, by IREF. So these are these are different groups or different versions of protein interaction uh, data sets that have been curated by various groups around the world. Uh, and we include those because you know maybe you want to just look at the intact interactions or the biogrid interactions. So you can you can just include those. Um, and. Uh, we also specifically, so any study where there's more than 100 protein interactions reported, it gets its own entry, so you can choose that uh, data from that study or not to include them. But um, there's a lot of studies that just report like a handful of interactions, and those are curated uh, by the various people, um, uh, by the various uh, people listed here after IREF. And so for those, we don't want we don't want to give them all their own network because it'd be kind of a boring network. It would have like you know ten interactions with them. that would be sort of boring. So we group all those together with what we call the small scale study. Right? And again, um, there's small scale studies from two different data sources. Right? So IREF is a large organization that Francis probably knows more about than I do um, that, uh, that groups together about seven of these groups that are independently curating different protein interaction uh, data sets. And BioGrid is a competitor to them that also puts together their, their own interaction data sets. And we don't care, we just take data from everybody. Okay, okay any questions about that? So I've showed you network weighting. I've pressed all the buttons, uh, colored the nodes a little bit. Let's color some nodes. This is really fun. OK, so now I've, I've colored the nodes based on the, uh, their annotations. OK, and let's go back and finish off our, our, our concept. OK. So, so far I've told you about gene recommender systems. I've described what a functional interaction network is. I've told you about how you could uh, uh, answer questions about gene function by looking at composite networks that are made up of weighted combinations of networks from various different sources. I've shown you one interface that does that, the gene mania interface. It's one I think is particularly good because I had a hand in making it. And now I'm going to tell you about, uh, if you once you're given a network, how you find genes that are highly interacting 
with, uh, with your query list. And this is the guilt by association idea. And then there's, in, there's two ways of evaluating guilt by association. Right, okay. So um, here, the query list, these are, you know, these are four genes in our query list, and let's say this is our network. I don't know why that's blue. And every once in a while, I, I fix the slide so it's not blue anymore. Um, <laughs> but it really wants to be blue. So like, you know, sometimes the world just tells you what it wants. Um, okay, and so you can see there's one network here, and then this is uh, this is what's called a connected component, in meaning that you could like walk between any pair of nodes in this network, but you can't go from here to here because there's no link from here to here. Okay. All right, and so these are a query list, and we want to find other genes that are highly interacting with the query list. We have two ways of going about that. Okay, so so we're going to score nodes based on the strength of their interaction. So uh, you know. Uh, red is, is the highest, and it means you're in the query list. Okay, so, whoa, I went backwards. So one of these algorithms is uh, what I call direct interaction. And basically that says you look at every node, and you see around it uh, essentially how many of your neighbors are in the query list, and how strong is your link to those. And then you compute your score based on that measurement. Okay, so you can see here that these nodes that don't directly interact with the query list, they, they have a score of zero, and so do these nodes that are, aren't even part of that network. Okay. The other way of doing it is called label propagation. And so the way that label propagation works, one way of uh, thinking about how it works, if people have described it in various ways, it's like this is a, you know, this is like water and these are pipes and they, each one of these have a little sink that goes down, you want to measure the flow or is heat diffusion. There's a lot, or uh, what's called random walk with restart. Uh, in fact, this label propagation algorithm was the first algorithm that Google used as a way of, of, of ranking search results. It was called ra uh, random walk with restart. And you know, basically, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so you can, you, the first step is you do the gen uh, direct interaction and you score these nodes. And then the second step is to redo the scoring. So when you redo the scoring, this node now is interacting with nodes that have a non-zero score. So it's going to get a non-zero score. And you redo the scoring over and over and over again. You keep iterating, and after some point, it stabilizes. Right? And then the label propagation, this is what it stabilizes at. And you can see that this, uh, this component here, this not connected component, doesn't ever get any of the label because there's no path there. But the, the strength of the label decreases as you get further and further away from the query genes. Okay. All right. Um, so this slide here just like goes through everything that I um, uh, just described, and it's largely for your notes. Um, but one important point here is, is what happens with this, with this algorithm, and you'll see this in the next slide as well, is is if two, if your query genes are in a group of, uh, of genes that are highly interacting with one another, uh, what, uh, what you, has been introduced to you as a module, when you do this iterative update of the scoring, they all, they all act synergistically to everybody gets their, own, their score increased together at the same time. So it's a way of like propagating to identify these modules. So this is an example where this is, you know, here's a network on the left, I'm showing you a label propagation example. Here's a network on the left, and each one of these dots is a node. Each of the edges, uh, these are links, and you can see there's like four modules on this network, and the size of the node indicates its, its score. So here, the query genes start with an initial score of one, right? And we're going to update the scores not only of the query genes, but of all the other uh, nodes in this network. Now, if we did like direct interaction, these, uh, these nodes here would get a very high score because they're directly linked to a query gene. Right? And then these ones might not get as high a score. Some of them are directly linked to query gene, but not all of them are. In fact, all of them seem to be. No, this one's not linked to all the query genes. Okay, good. Okay, and so after label propagation, you can see that the score for this one has gone down because there's no other nodes around to support it. And in fact, it's getting a lot of sort of negative information from these nodes that are saying, okay, well, your score should actually be closer to zero. 
but the score of these genes, they're all supporting each other. Right? So it's, it's, it's rolling out to identify the modules. And that's what label propagation style algorithms do. So when you're identifying this, or the, when you're using guilt by association with label propagation, your guilty associates, you, if, if, if there's multiple indirect paths between you and one of the query genes, you get a higher score, is the other way to think about it. And having multiple indirect paths between you and the query gene is kind of like saying you're in the same social clique, right? So that's, you know, having multiple indirect paths in addition to a direct path is like the easiest way of identifying whether some, something is the same module or not, right? So not only do you know each other, not only are you friends, but all your friends or most of your friends are also friends of that other person, well, you, now you're in the same social clique rather than if you just are friends but you don't have any other shared friends, that largely means that I don't know, sort of a, it's a, a friendship, a, a sort of a, you know, a more distant friendship that maybe doesn't link to yours. <laughs> I don't have a good explanation, <laughs> so I'm just going to stop. You have a drinking problem. What, sorry? You have a drinking problem. I have a drinking problem. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you mean. <laughs> Yeah, there's someone you met at the bar, you hardly remember them, but now you're Facebook friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's never happened to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so the three parts of Gene Mania. Um, we have a large automatically updated connection of interaction networks. There are other interfaces like this, like the string interface, which I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, uh, we have a query algorithm that finds genes and networks that are functionally associated with your uh, query gene list. And so, you know, being able to weight networks dynamically uh, is something that's unique to our interface. Um, and we have an interactive client-side network browser with extensive link out. So when I, I you know, when I, after I pressed the go and then all that stuff came back, I was fooling around with that browser, but I was not, I didn't need to use anything online. Right, so all of that is downloaded onto your computer. And you also installed the Gene Mania plugin for Cytoscape as well, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so where's our data come from? Like I said, there's this organization of like eight or seven or eight groups that are all like going through papers and doing the hard work of, of curating uh, reported interaction in these papers and then they compile them together into these large interaction uh, data sets. We, we use them extensively, and we use IREF index, which is a, a simple, interact, uh, simple way of interacting with uh, the IREF group. We use BioGrid, the evil competitor, uh, because <laughs> cause they have genetic interactions, and they also happen to have physical interactions. They are? Well, yeah, BioGrid is in Montreal, and IREF is in the UK, but Ian Bell. Ah. Okay. Yeah, so that's the main Canadian. Ah, okay. There we go. Ian Donaldson was the one who made the IREF index that we use. Yeah. yeah. Yes, not all, not not everything's good in Canada. <laughs> uh, we get our co-expression data largely from Gene Expression Om Omnibus, and these are automatically updated. Uh, we get our shared protein domains from Interpro now, which is um, which are the are, are the people who are automatically scanning these things. We get predicted interactions from I2D, and these are what I've called uh, what I have, I've used this word before. I've described them in Teralog. So. That, that means that the orthologs of those genes interact in another organism. That's what an enterolog is. We add some organism-specific databases. There's some legacy databases that we put in. We use uh, gene ID mappings from ensemble to ensemble plants. So like I want the interface to be as easy as possible. So we recognize most gene identifiers as long as they're unique. We don't do anything. We ignore non-unique identifiers, um, basically. So, uh, and we get gene and network descriptions from Ontrogene and, and PubMed, and we link out to them. And our gene annotations come from Geontology, Goa, and the Model Organism databases. And, you know, we haven't updated in two years, um, and sorry about that, but we have an update coming out in a couple weeks. Uh, I've just looked at the update, and it looks like it's good, and we just have to go through and double-check a few things, but we'll have new data soon. Okay, gene identifiers. So we, we try to recognize anything, uh, but you know if you give the gene symbol, um, that's the best identifier for the gene. Um, 
it's the one that's uh, that's uh, not that's unique and uh, so uniquely identifies a gene unless you're like a weird Drosophila researcher where in Drosophila there's gene identifiers that are spelled exactly the same way and are only distinguished by capitalization. So I mean I don't know why they decided to do that but there you go. So, uh, so there, are some, there are some gene symbols including one of my favorite genes that we can identify in Drosophila from the gene symbol because we ignore capitalization. So maybe or maybe not. It depends. So we recognize uniprot identifiers, um, but we recognize only a subset of uniprot identifiers. Those are, those are the specially blessed ones uh, that are unique. And it's not, with mass spec data, sometimes you get a mix. So um, we can recognize a lot of what you give us, but not everything necessarily. Just try it out and see, and see, what, we, uh, see, see what we can do. OK. Um, right, and so as I said, we're two years out of date, and that's that problem will be resolved in a couple weeks. Um, so we might not get all the uh, gene mappings, but if you're having trouble identifying a gene and we're not recognizing it, you can go and try it another way of identifying the same gene, and we can often get it. Okay, we have Cytoscape plugin. It has all the same gene mania functionality. Um, the nice thing about it is it can take longer gene lists. Uh, up to 500 or probably the same size of the organism and you can use it to access older gene data releases and this is one of the things that Robin was talking about as well in that if you want reproducible uh, experiments well you can refer people to the Cytoscape plugin it's going to have it's going to behave in the same way but then you can access old data uh, old data releases that are no longer on the website um, and again, you can interrogate gene mania networks with other cytoscape analyses um, and supports longer query lists. And so, and there is a way to add new organisms. So you can make gene mania for like horse if you want. Uh, it's not straightforward, but it's possible with this cytoscape plugin. Okay. Uh, and this paper is describing uh, the cytoscape plugin. Uh, we also have something called Query Runner. So, you know, we're doing gene function prediction all the time. Maybe what you want to do is you just want to run through and make predictions in each gene ontology category of which other genes should be in that category. So we have like an offline thing called Query Runner that does that sort of thing. When, what we use this for is we use it for um, assessing the added value of a new network. So like in uh, one of our collaborations uh, with... Uh, Brenda Andrews and Charlie Boone's lab, they generated a new genetic interaction network and they wanted to say, well, you know, what now? Like, how have we changed the world? So, so you can say, well, you know, you know, with this new network, you are this much more, uh, e it's easier, you can recover this much more about what was already known about gene function, right? So it's the added value of the network to recovering what people had figured out about gene function in a very uh, laborious and uh, painful way. Okay. And so uh, another great gene uh, recommender system to use is the string database. Uh, they're uh, great and they've been around a lot longer. Um, their focus is more on protein, whereas ours is more on genes. So of course we have genes and proteins in, uh, but we include some interactions that are a bit more gene specific, like <laughs> genetic interactions. Um, which in here, if you focus more on proteins, you're focusing more on like things that are, that are true for proteins. In particular, one of the nice things that, this is uh, an example of a uh, string output. One of the nice things that string does is where, where there's a structure for the protein. I don't know if you can see it in the nodes, but they, they show the structure. That's pretty awesome. So. Here's their list. Um, for them, they, the way they don't use label propagation to score genes, they use genetic di direct interaction. And their, their, their network, so this is the score from gene uh, direct interaction, and they want that score to be translated as, as probability uh, of having the same function or sharing at least some aspect of function. 
we don't provide a translation for our score. We just see these are the tw 20 most highly interacting genes. Okay. And they have like seven different networks, but they pre-combine all the networks for you. Right? So you don't have your choice of what networks to turn on and off. And it's, I don't think you can yet upload a network to a new network to them. Okay. Um, so uh, here's sort of the, the, the comparison of, of string and gene mania. One other thing that uh, string is, is particularly good at is they have a very large organism coverage. So they're, they're essentially computing anything that there's an ensemble genome for. So they cover 2,000 organisms, largely bacterial, and a lot of their interactions are bacterial specific using things like, um, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. So they use things like the fact that in bacteria, uh, genes with the same function are on the same operon as a way of saying whether or not two genes have, are likely to have shared function. They also look for, especially in bacteria, genes that are physically interacting with each other and, and are obligate interactors, often they just get fused. So if you see gene fusion, meaning that the, you know, the, it just becomes one long protein, that's often a, a good indicator for shared function. And they also use this idea of co-occurrence. So the idea of co-occurrence is if you look at across all the bacteria and you look at uh, bacterial species and you look at the different phenotypes that they have, like do they have like that squiggly tail whose name I forgot, um, and you know uh, all the bacteria with that that tail. Um, no one's going to help me, right? <laughs> but everyone knows what I mean. Um, they, you know, if there's genes that are specifically in those bacteria. That gives a strong indication that 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 you know, the presence of the squiggly tail is related to these genes. So genes that are in the same set of uh, bacteria often have some aspect of shared function. You look like a flagell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, and so so that's 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 what uh, that's what they're uh, particularly good at. Those those types of arguments they don't work as well, uh, at least in our experience in ma mammals. I want to say higher eukaryotes, but I don't really know. Uh, but I certainly know in mammals it doesn't work. Those, those types of things don't work as well. Certainly there aren't operons, um, except in, I guess, C. elegans. But, um, you know, these other kind of co-occurrence things, it's not as strong a signal as it is in bacteria, in my experience. Also, they include text mining, and we don't. So they, they ask whether or not pairs of genes occur in the same abstract. And this is another useful indicator of shared function. Okay, great. Right, so we talked about functional interaction networks, right? Those, those are networks where the strength of the link uh, between two nodes tells you about the, um, the likelihood that they share a function. Uh, we talked about guilt by association, so um, genes that, uh, if you're highly linked to genes that have a specific function, it's likely that you have that function too. We talked about gene recommender systems. You put genes in, it gives you more genes back you think you'll like. We talked about context-specific network weighting schemes. In particular, if you, give, if you have a long list and you want to know what networks are relevant for predicting genes that are similar to those in the list, do you find networks where those genes are highly connected to one another? Uh, we <coughs> went into the difference between direct interaction and label propagation. So direct interaction, when you take the network, it's only the you can only get a score if you are linked to a gene with uh, in the query list, but in a label propagation type setting, you you can uh, your score depends not only on direct interaction but number of shared indirect interactions, and it's slightly better for identifying modules because of this property. Um, you can now use gene recommender systems to answer two types of questions: What does my gene do, or give me more genes like these? Um, if you can't now, you certainly will be able to once you go through Veronique's um, um, assignment. And uh, maybe you are able to select the appropriate network weighting scheme to ask, answer your questions about gene function. If that wasn't clear, certainly I'm around and Veronique is around to ask questions about that, and it's in your notes. Okay, great. Uh, so we're on a coffee break and networking session. Mm -hmm.